Does it seem like markets are now finally on the same page as the Fed? Well, I think, yes, they are on the same page because the Fed has been very consistent with its message of higher for longer. Recently, as the regulation and the overhang has increased, it somehow has gone, Bitcoin, it's gone from 16 back to, to 24,000, 23,000. Is this crypto spring now, in your view, uh, after a crypto winter? Or not, well, not yet. I, I don't know about the specific label, but I think um, what you're certainly seeing is that, you know, just like with big tech and tech, there were, you know, names that, you know, on the NASDAQ that Down the sold same off amount. significantly. Yeah. And then Almost. people sort of say, okay, where, where are the, the, the long-term platforms? And, and there tends to be, uh, you know, some higher degree of confidence in that. And so, you know, Bitcoin is sort of here to stay. What's going on in the crypto market? Should you invest in Bitcoin? At the moment, the market is in a state of flux. Many experts are predicting that the value of Bitcoin will rise in the near future, and some are saying it will crash like in 2022. I know, there are several questions which are hovering on everyone's mind, like what's going to happen next? Will Bitcoin ever rise again? Or will it crash just like in 2022? To answer all your doubts away, in this video, Michael Saylor has shared his viewpoint on the Bitcoin and crypto market. So if you're interested in learning what Michael Saylor has to say on Bitcoin and whether Bitcoin is here to stay or not, be sure to stay until the end of this video. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to Wealthy Value for more of the latest updates on the economy, crypto, and the market. Let's get into the video. Bitcoin is a commodity that is uh, scarce where the primary use case is money or that is a long-term store of value so the reason you want to hold bitcoin is is you want to hone own a product on an open network for a long period of time and its use case is to be money and so the you know the value and use is store of value now um when you're holding a stock, you're holding a share of equity in a company. In essence, you're, you're owning a, a corporation as property. Um, if your goal is to own that as a store of value over a long period of time, then, of course, that is competitive uh, to Bitcoin, financially speaking. Some people own companies for other purposes, um, and we could talk about those, but but I think it's instructive for an investor that's thinking about whether they want to allocate to Bitcoin or whether they want to allocate to um, equity to consider the difference. As an asset class, Bitcoin is unique. It's often described as digital gold and has a number of characteristics that make it well suited to be a store of value. Firstly, it's scarce. There are only 21 million bitcoins that will ever be mined, and the supply is currently deflationary. Secondly, it's durable. Bitcoin is resistant to centralized controlling, fraud, and third-party interference. Thirdly, it's portable. Bitcoin can be stored on a digital device and sent anywhere in the world instantly. These characteristics make bitcoin a commodity that's well suited to be a store of value. As the world becomes more digital, there's a growing demand for a digital asset that can act as a long-term store of value. Bitcoin is well positioned to fill this role due to its scarcity, durability, and portability. Saylor observes that people often envision catastrophic scenarios and may overreact, leading to an ineffective rationale in their decision making. He warns investors to not become excessively focused on risk, and maintaining a long-term perspective is important. And Bitcoin is the best asset class for the long term. Political risk. And uh, political risk can come from the mayor of your town. The mayor decides that, um, that they don't want to have your kind of business within city limits, and so they zone it out. Actually, it can start at the neighborhood zoning board. They can zone you out. Then the, neighbor, then the mayor can zone you out. Then the governor can change the regulations. Like right now, New York State, you know, is suing Paxos over their stable coin. Okay, that's a New York action. It's not even a federal action. So the state can take action against you or, an, or your own country where your domicile can take action against you. 
What makes Bitcoin different from other digital currencies is that it's decentralized, meaning there's no single authority or middleman that controls it. This makes it resistant to government interference or manipulation. Saylor knows that companies may face legal or regulatory changes from local state or foreign governments which can have a significant effect on their ability to operate effectively. But in recent scenarios, regulation is hovering in the crypto market as well. After reaching $25,000, Bitcoin prices fall back after SEC scrutiny and Fed's hawkish view. So will Bitcoin crash again in 2023? There are many investors, corporates, and large institutions who hold a bearish view on Bitcoin and firmly believe that Bitcoin might fall in the near future. They consider this rally a major bull trap, rather than a bull run. Let's get into the next clip to see why Saylor believes that Bitcoin is here to stay. And of course, before going ahead, don't forget to give this video a big thumbs up. The fifth risk is competitive risk. Maybe I'm the best in the world at something. Like I produced, Nokia was the greatest mobile phone company and they got wiped out. Uh, somebody else produces a product quick that's better than mine, that's cheaper than mine. Uh, they might be an in-kind competitor. I'm a restaurant. Someone else has a better restaurant. They wipe me out. Uh, I manufacture steel. Someone manufactures steel cheaper. They wipe me out. I'm an airline. Someone else has cheaper flights. They wipe me out. Um, <clears throat> you cannot avoid uh, competitive risk over the long term. But there's another kind of risk, which is like not in-kind competition, but I'll call it co uh, technology risk. Uh, I'm the world's leading manufacturer of... Um, of horse uh, horse buggies and then henry ford comes along with car and nobody wants horse buggies anymore or i'm a horse breeder or i'm a buggy whip manufacturer or i i produce uh, electric light bulbs that are incandescent and then people want fluorescent and then they and then i have fluorescent light bulbs and they want led light bulbs and so over time new types of technology i i'm, I'm the world's leader in typewriters and the people want mainframes or, or computers or word processors. And I'm Wang and I'm the leader in word processors and I got wiped out by the PC. So there are always technology cycles. And, and here is a, it's a, it's a cruel risk because um, the world is full of examples of companies that got wiped out by a better technology. Xerox, you know, Kodak, but the world is also full of companies that got wiped out because they saw the new technology coming. And so they made an acquisition or they invested obscene amounts of money to compete and they still failed, even though they thought they were going to compete. And so this technology risk drives that strategic risk element up. People justify bad strategies based upon technology threats. So ultimately, and of course, the reason that they make the $10 billion strategic mistake is they thought they were fending off the, like, Time Warner decided to merge with AOL in one of the most catastrophically, you know, failed mergers in history, because Time Warner said, yeah, you know, we need to get into like video streaming and the internet and the internet represents a risk to the media business. So the solution was to buy uh, AOL for $150 billion. Now, AOL said, oh, we're at risk from, you know, Google and, and the like. And so we have to sell ourselves. So you have one, uh, one frightened, struggling company merging with another frightened, struggling company. And the result when the dust settled was something like $150 billion to $200 billion of shareholder capital got wiped out. But they, and, and was that a governance failure? <laughs> Or was that a strategic failure? Or was that a technology failure? All those risk factors drove people to like light a hundred billion dollars on fire. They all thought they're doing the right thing. But of course, this is human action. The fact, the risk factor is there's someone that has the ability to issue a hundred and fifty billion dollars worth of stock in order to solve a problem. As we know by looking at the world, oftentimes when you have someone with enough power uh, to make a $150 billion decision, it's coin flip. They might make the right one, but they might make a $150 billion mistake. And you know the difference between that and Bitcoin is in Bitcoin, nobody has the power to issue $150 billion of new Bitcoin. The world is full of companies that got wiped out by better technologies. 
Blockbuster, Kodak, and Nokia are just a few examples. But Bitcoin is different. It's not just a technology, it's a whole new way of thinking about money. Michael Saylor said that companies face constant threats from technological advancements which are continually emerging, and they must invest a large amount of resources in combating these threats with political risk in particular. But he believes that nothing can replace Bitcoin. Well, there are several views and predictions on Bitcoin, some are bullish and some are bearish. Only time will tell where Bitcoin will head next, but one thing's for sure, Bitcoin ain't going anywhere. But what about you guys? What do you think about Michael Saylor's thoughts regarding Bitcoin? Will Bitcoin ever rise again? Or will it crash again in 2023? How should investors approach Bitcoin in 2023? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll see you in the next video. Adios and thanks for watching.